making right choices. Some choices may not amount to anything, but we have to make them. Other choices are tremendously important and of the gravest of concern. And those I'm concerned about have to do with what will impact us eternally. When you preach the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, you're concerned about that. You're concerned about the fact that you made that decision to preach it and all that that implies because you can't preach what you don't know. So it implies a great deal of study. And due to the very nature of what you read of in the New Testament concerning the work of faithful preachers of the gospel, it means that you're going to have to bear up under all sorts of things that when you start out preaching, you don't know really what that means. But if you preach the whole counsel of God, preaching the word, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting, with all long suffering and doctrine, you will find out. Uh, the old saying goes, your metal will be tested. But not, not, that's not just true of preachers of the gospel. That's true of anybody who is going to be a Christian like the New Testament defines the word Christian to be. Because when you wear that name, as I've said many, off, many times and from this pulpit and other places, you're saying, I am of Christ. Well, you can't be of Christ and not let him have his way with thee. The only way we know his will is by proper study of the word and meditation on the same and using it when it comes to making these de decisions. I have to determine, will I do good as the Bible defines good or will I do evil, Deuteronomy thirty fifteen. Will I set my affections on things above or will I set my affections on the affairs of this present world? Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Will I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto me? Matthew six thirty three. or will I not? Will I choose to worship God in spirit and in truth? John four twenty four, or not? Will I choose to let Christ in every way have his way with me? Paul talked about in Romans 6, 17 and 18 to the church at Rome, motivating them to be closer to God in faithfulness by reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians. He said that you were servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. That Greek word for servant is doulos. It's a slave. You actually gave up your freedom to do as you please and resigned yourself to the fact to do as he pleases. There are momentous decisions we make in life that have nothing to do with going to heaven or going to hell, directly at least. I say directly. What about buying a house? It involves a lot of thought. What about the job you take? It involves a lot of thought. Sometimes it may not take so much thought. That's the only one available and you'd like to eat. But even then for the Christian, you have to think about what does that job require of me? Does it require of me things that would cause me to violate the will of heaven? To not honor God as his word teaches? On and on we could go. And our master is pleading all along through his word, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many they are that enter therein. For narrow is the gate, and straight the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, American Standard Version. A person can benefit then, all of us can, 
we can benefit from a careful study of several Old Testament characters who loved God and kept His commandments. In other words, they were faithful to God. But the one I have in mind this morning is Moses. Why was he so successful in his journey through life? We have all sorts of folks out here who make a big living going around speaking on how to be successful. I wonder how many people really look at what biblical success is and why was Moses successful? Why did he usually make the right choice in the decisions that he had to make? And how was he able to accomplish such great things for God? Well, a sampling of verses from God's Word, I think, gives us the answer. In using men such as Moses to encourage, to strengthen, to even rebuke weak members of the church, the writer of Hebrews made it clear about why he was such a successful man before God. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, listen to the decision, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to share what we would say to be ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, accounting the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked unto the recompense of reward. Years ago, I was able to go into the Cairo Museum, and they have all of King Tutankhamun's treasures there, and he was one of the lesser kings. But I have read this verse many times and thought of what you beheld there. I, I don't know how much gold there is involved in that, and other precious stones and such things as that. And as I say, he was a lesser pharaoh than some of the others. And yet there's no telling what kind of riches that was there, thinking of the day and time, and not only the riches, the power and might the man had. But the Scripture says of Moses, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood that the destroyer of the firstborn should not touch him. Hebrews 11, 24 through 28. And so that gives me great insight into this man Moses that inspiration is selected as an example for each one of us to serve Christ faithfully in the church. Moses realized that faithfully serving God meant making right choices. Notice that he refused one thing, he chose another. He refused that which handicapped him from serving God. He chose that which encouraged him and promoted him to serve God. So the key to Moses' success is found in these words. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's ill treatment in the American Standard Version. Notice, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for season. We have always had more people in this world who love the pleasures of sin though they are but for a season. I would never try to say to anybody that sin is not pleasurable. It is. That's the way that the devil strives to get you to disobey God. It's pleasurable to the flesh. But he rejected all of that, accounting the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. This tells me he looked beyond what this life has to offer because he looked into the recompense of reward. So he didn't let that which was temporary blind him to that which was eternal. The devil has this world. He has control of all things material. And since we're in a fleshly body with fleshly appetites, then of course that appeals to us. Far too many today choose then what is the easy way that promises fleshly satisfaction. It caresses the human ego. It's nice because of the 
vain glory of life that's gratifying. It's the way that the majority of the world has chosen to travel. Always has, always will. And the view of a great many people is this. Can so many be wrong? Exodus 23, verse 2. Well, the inspired wise man reminds all who will hear. Proverbs 14, verse 12. We ought to have this memorized. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We can, not that we would explicitly say so in our own mind, but the way we've geared ourselves up, we can pretend that sin just doesn't exist. I talked to a man one time, years ago, who was a member of the church, but he lived a good part of his early life, anything but, faithful to God, but he had been brought up in a home in proximity to the church. He knew what the Lord's church was. He had been baptized into Christ, but that's about it for a period of his life. And I asked him, since we became pretty good friends, I said, how did you keep all that you had been taught from bothering you and upsetting you and pricking your conscience because he lived quite a few years away from the Lord. And he made this comment. Well, just any time it came to my mind, I put it out. I just would not think about what I knew the Bible taught was in store for me if I died this way. Whoa, what did that say about our will? The strength of our will. If you choose to let the world have its way and worldly people have their say, Satan wins the victory. If you base what's right and wrong on the way of the world, then Satan wins. The Apostle Paul begged the brethren at Ephesus to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But notice that's what not to do. But what are we to do about them? But rather even reprove them. It's not just enough, Ephesians 5.11, to just withdraw yourself from evil. Certainly that's part of it. Get rid of the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, Paul wrote, you do these things, you don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. But what fills the void? What takes up our interest? How do we spend our time once we're rejecting these things? Well, of course, learning the Bible and how to live life, I know that. But part of that is to reprove error. You heard me say in the beginning, and we all know this, that no political party, uh, public education or private education, God did not place within them the obligation to preach what is necessary to save souls from men. That's the church's responsibility. So what do we expect then if we withdraw ourselves from these? We must be busy reproving those in sin. How are you going to convert somebody to Christ? When you get a Bible study with somebody, a novel idea these days, but if you do get someone that says, yes, I would like to study the Bible. Now there's no way to have a proper Bible study Study what needs to be known and must be known so that a person can genuinely be converted to Christ and all that converted to Christ means. And not come upon things in that person's life that he or she is going to have to come to grips with in the light of what the Bible teaches. There's no way you can do it. How would there ever be anybody to repent of anything if they didn't know what to repent from? Turn from this, that's evil. Turn to that, that's right. Well, you've got to know right and evil, evil and right. So there's going to, be, going to be times when you're studying with somebody or however, whether it's an in-depth sit-down study over a period of weeks or whether it's just simply visiting with a coworker or something and they bring up something that is just as wrong as it can be. What do we do about that? Do we just step aside and make sure our mouth's a little tighter and say nothing? Or do we say, wait a minute, You'd be surprised if you just said, that's not right. 
Most people, most people aren't expecting anybody to say that. Or you might say, what you just said, how do you know that's true? There's all sorts of things you can do. But do it, you must. And you must make that decision. It's part of rebuking the world. It's part of your being faithful. It's why Christ obtained a good confession before Pilate. He stood the course. He wouldn't bend. I said about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. Well, they wouldn't. You know, you've said this. Our God's able to deliver us. But whether he doesn't or whether he does, we're not going to bow down and serve your God. Why is that written and what do you get out of it regarding your life when you read those things? Reproof of sinful pleasure will not result in one being rewarded by those who love this present world and with worldly riches. But such is the right choice if one desires to please God, if one desires to go to heaven. Why was Moses so often able to choose correctly? When we read of many others who didn't, they made incorrect choices. I think there's at least four reasons. You may find others, but there are at least four reasons we can note about Moses. First of all, Moses enjoyed the benefit of being nurtured and trained. Notice, nurtured and trained by his own fleshly mother. For a long time now in America, too many are putting the training of their children and the nurturing of their children into the hands of some stranger or into the hands of public education by people who are just not what they ought to be as teachers. It was said by the Apostle Paul of the young preacher Timothy. And you know that's in your Bible for a reason. And that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. He talks about him having the unfeigned faith that is unpretending, non-hypocritical faith, confidence, trust in God. And he says it first of all was in your grandmother, then in your mother, 2 Timothy 1, 5. Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, doesn't it? If they had that real genuine faith, they had it because they knew the Word of God. And if it dwelt in Timothy, it's because he was taught the Word of God and he believed it. So you have both Moses and then in the New Testament, the young preacher Timothy, who were taught and given the wherewithal to make right choices. See, right choices means there's a standard by which I make those choices. There's no substitute. There's no other way to put this. There's just no substitute for godly training in an early age. You've all heard of Foy Wallace Jr., great preacher of another generation. Much of his work's still around. A lot of us had the privilege of hearing him. But his mother taught him to read from the King James Version that he was reading from the time he was four years old. Remember that when you struggle with the hard words of the King James Version. Because one thing when you study American history that existed among the pioneers when they had dirt floor houses and little to do with, they hardly had a book unless it was some book of modern day for that time, Remedies, which would just have to kill you as not. But what else they had in all of those homes? was a King James Version of the Bible, and they read it. I did a little study some years ago on the influence of the King James Version in past generation, or generations, of the vocabulary of the English-speaking world, and it is amazing at the terminology that is used in a part of our language that we use in describing all sorts of things or discussing things, which terms came from the King James Version. Now, how does that happen? 
Somebody's hearing it read and somebody's reading it all of the time. So there's one thing, what Moses had that we all need, a mother who would do that. And remember, she was under adverse circumstances to be able to do that. Second, Moses had a great faith in God. Well, without biblical faith, one will never be able to consistently make right choices. It's just the way it is. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him, make right choices. Because you don't please Him unless you make right choices. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. It is a truth that then belief comes, and belief comes by hearing. And belief comes by hearing the word of Christ. That means understanding it, knowing how it applies to you, and let him have through his word his way with you. Moses believed in the word of God. So should we today. So much of preaching that's done all around today, not just in the church, but it can and does happen in the church. We talk a lot about the Bible. Have you noticed that? The Bible's the Word of God. It's important. You ought to study it. It's great. It'll judge us in the last day. But so much of the teaching of the Bible that really gets down to where we live every day is not done. It doesn't get us down to the point of where we, well, if you study law or if you study business administration in some of the great universities, They've gone the direction of what's called case studies to train people. We need case studies in the church. Oh, we do have it. It's in the Bible, and you've got all sorts of case studies in there. But what about your own case? Should I get on your case? <laughs> Amazing how we use the word case. But the Bible gets on your case. It very definitely does. The Bible will not leave you alone. That's one reason it doesn't get studied. It bothers people. It bothers people to read a lot of places in the Bible because they're sensible people. They know what they're doing. That's the reason the fellow told me earlier when he thought about doing evil, he just put out of his mind what he knew the Bible said and went ahead and kept doing what he wanted to do. And by the way, he said when he... When he changed is when he came back to those things he'd put out of his mind. And I guess we could say it this way. He let Jesus have his way with him. That is, he repented and turned to do what he already knew was right. And that's what the prodigal son did. There's no indication the prodigal son learned something new. He just recalled what he had been taught. And with saneness and sobriety and honesty, he acted upon it. So we need to know the specifics we need to think about how does the Bible here affect me and what I'm about to do and of course that gets into all the business of how does you ascertain Bible authority how do you apply that authority to your life and the choices you make so these things are important when it comes to why Moses did what he did why he was able to make great choices his case was a case of always letting God have his way with him in whatever he did. I don't think we begin to realize what he gave up when he chose to reject all of the might and power of Egypt. But he gave it up. And he gave it up largely because his mom had taught him and taught him the truth, taught him who he really was, an Israelite, and who his God was. Think of all the things she taught him. Third, Moses looked beyond this world to the recompense of reward. Hebrews eleven twenty six. That's coming even as certain ones of the Catholic Church said the Lord decided not to come back. That was published this past week, I think it was. Well, I don't care what the Catholic Church says much about anything unless they're saying it and it's already first taught in the Bible. I don't care much about what anybody says about things, even in the church, where they don't teach what the Bible says. And I've always tried not to let those who are my near and dear friends or family bother me to the sense that I'm going to compromise the truth that I know 
simply because they are who they are or they have a special relationship to me or whatever. Those things make no difference. I know that. But it's amazing that the people who do look at this world and they don't think about the reward out there. There's only two possible rewards. You're going to hell or you're going to heaven. That's it. It's all dependent on how I live here and that's dependent on the decisions I make. There's no some sort of in-between limbo for folks. It's heaven or hell. And it's got to be done here and now. It has to be done here and now to get ready for the there and then. We must learn that the wages of sin is death. It does not change. It will always be separation from God. And if you die separated from God, it's eternal separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Free gift of God. Sometimes we need to just study what all God did for us. The love of God, the love of Christ, what the second person of God had did to give up heaven and the form of God and become a man, do all things in life we couldn't do. And then guiltless, sinless, go to the cross and die on our behalf, such a terrible death. Moses knew all of that. He knew all the importance of making choices that would guarantee him a place with all who's holy once he died. And then the last, the fourth one. Moses set his sights higher than most. Moses set his sights on things above. If you look on television, if you look at the career opportunities that are being offered for those in high school or vocational school or college, whatever. Most of it's of this world, isn't it? Most of it has to do with what you can accomplish in this world. But you would think members of the church and all that that term members of the church means would look different from that. Paul pleads with Christians today saying, set your mind, I have to do that. I can't say, you said it for me. You can encourage me by your godly living, which is a choice you must make, to make such choices in my life. But you can't force me to do that against my will. I have to want to. I think the greatest challenge that parents face in rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is so that when they are no longer around to personally influence their children, that they will choose to serve God out of an in-depth conviction built upon thus saith the Lord propositions and godly examples set before them. Unless some way you can get your children to build their own personal faith in Christ built upon the truth of God's word, Romans 10, 17. Count them gone. If they're going to serve Christ because you make them, that's no service of Christ, really. If they're going to serve Christ, and I put that in quotes, only when you're around, they're not serving Christ. How many times, I just simply can't count it, that I've watched young people grow up appearing to be something with God. And as soon as they're out from under their parents' jurisdiction, they're gone. And immediately you find out they have not one scintilla of faith in God and His system of salvation. They never cared about it. It's just what they had to do growing up at home. They had to get up and brush their teeth. They had to get up and get ready. And they had to get up and go to school. And they had to this, that, and the other. So they had to get up and go to church and Bible study. There was nothing there within them that says, I do this because I love God. There was nothing there. It just was what was done in their home. So many people are part of the church. I won't say members. Just like Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and Presbyterians and Jews and everybody else. That's what they were born into. Had a fellow argue that case with me that we're all what we are where we were born. If you had been born in Saudi Arabia, you would automatically without any choice whatsoever, you would have grown up to be a Muslim or in India, Hindu, whatever. Not necessarily so, because I think some of us believe that. 
But born in America doesn't guarantee you're going to be a Christian, does it? So why would it guarantee you otherwise that you'd be anything else? It may be that some people let themselves do that because it is convenient to do that rather than get your head chopped off. You know, that's just the way it works. But everybody on this earth as a free moral agent who's normal before God, have their faculties, God expects them to be hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you, etc. Those are present tense. You keep on doing that, God guarantees you, you'll find the truth. So Moses did these things. You may find other things in the life of Moses, being more particular, but these work, and they'll work for you, and they'll work for me. And some of us who lived a long time in service to God, facing whatever in life, making mistakes, getting over them, doing better, but never quitting, never with a thought of quitting. We realize why we didn't when we read about people like Moses and think about what's revealed about him and why he was what he was. If you're not a child of God this morning, will you resolve in your heart to do what you know the Bible says right, let come what may, believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? As a child of God, are you still looking to Moses, to Abraham, and all other godly people that are there in the book divine to strengthen and help us? as a pattern for godly living? If not, whatever's in your life that's handicapping you from serving God, would you truly from the heart repent of it and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness? Now's a good time to do that because really it's the only time we have and you're encouraged after, I hope, this sermon and the song we'll sing to obey the truth. And so do so while we stand and sing.